The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. This is Mark Olson speaking at you from Milwaukee. I should say cold Milwaukee today. <laughs> the good news is we're not in Buffalo. <laughs> Those guys will be digging out for the next uh, two months, maybe. Uh, topic today is going to be on balancing and pressure differential control, typically a very popular uh, topic when we get into balancing. We have quite a few people on the uh, list here today. In fact, I'm um, reaching out to some folks in South Africa and Europe. Um, welcome aboard, guys. You're seven hours ahead of us, so you might not be having a coffee. Maybe some other beverage. Uh, <laughs> so uh, cheers. Welcome aboard. Uh, we have a tag team here today. It's uh, myself doing the first half of the presentation. It will be a PowerPoint going over the concepts uh, of flow control, basically differential pressure control. And then we'll be switching over to Bob, Hot Rod, Roar, and Kevin, who are on standby in our lab. Bob, are you there? Maybe say hi. I am. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll be um, referencing a lot of material that's in hydronic, uh, or hydrex number eight, hydronic balancing. If you haven't uh, seen that, I'll take a look at it if you have an interest in getting into more detail. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, hydronics, uh, no need to tell you too much, but those that are on board new, this is a free design journal that we make available every six months to our followers and the industry. Um, it's free. And uh, just send us a $200 postage and handling. No, just joking. <laughs> we, <laughs> we send it out to you, and we also pick up the uh, postage. So um, uh, you can register for that online on our website. Uh, number 15, you can see the big one there, was issued just a couple of months ago on hydronic systems. So we've been hearing about magnetic separators and uh, the like. Uh, take a look at that. It's uh, been updated for that type of technology in hydronic systems, magnet magnetic dirt separators, that is. Or if you want to know different concepts on how to decouple pumps on a chiller system, uh, it's also included. Number 16 will be out in January, and that will be um, circulation in hydronic systems circulation in pine pumps. So we'll be taking a detailed look at um, component selection in um, building up circuits and uh, pump selection, looking at different types of pumping strategies and the ins and outs of issues surrounding basically flow in a system. So be on the lookout for that. In fact, next month's webinar in December will be just on that topic and have our guest speaker, John Siegenthaler, uh, heading that presentation. So. Let's jump right into it here. Um, the first thing a designer does when he sits down to put a circuit together, uh, he has an intended um, purpose for that circuit. In this case, we have a, an example of a, call it baseboard fin tube uh, heat exchanger. We have some type of means for pumping fluid through that. And the designer is going to have a number of components in his circuit, swing checks. Here we have a balancing valve over here. We have a number of T's and elbows and what have you. And to select the um, circulator that would best um, fit in this circuit, let's say our design flow rate is six gallons per minute, just for argument's sake. The, by manual calculation, the designer can basically take all of these different individual components in the system outside of the pump, convert them in terms of a res hydraulic resistance standpoint to equivalent feet of pipe, add them up, and with that, using a simple formula, can then graph that relationship of that system on a curve that plots uh, head loss or added as a function of flow rate. Okay, So this is the beginning of analyzing a circuit and selecting a pump. Now I indicated that our example here we want a six gallons per minute for that heat emitter to most optimally work. Okay, So we have to select a pump. Well the designer might have a number of pumps available to him. Just say for argument's sake he has three he can plot those graphs of how the pump performs uh, flow rate as a function of pressure drop or, or head. And where the red line, the pumps, crosses the blue line is the point of equilibrium. So if we started off at circulator number three and said, well, will this do the job? We can see that, nope, uh, it crosses our system circuit with our heat emitter at less than five gallons per minute. So that's not, kind of, that's not going to cut it, right? So there's two other pumps here that are available to him. And where they cross the line, yeah, yeah, they're, they're up there. They're up you know, seven and change. 
And so this would suffice as a circulator to meet his need to deliver the appropriate flow in that circuit to work. All right? Which of those two circulators does he choose? All right? If all he is worried about is flow in that single circuit, they both will pretty much do equally the job and perhaps a factor such as price, availability, perhaps electrical consumption might dictate it. Okay? Uh, otherwise, um, uh, if, um, otherwise they both will suffice. Now I said six gallons per minute. If you took this pump and stuck it in this circuit right here we just talked about, you will get almost eight gallons per minute. You want six. This is where your balancing valve comes into play. We show it as a glow valve here. So the contractor, after the job's been installed, will dial that balancing valve down. And basically what he does in doing so, shifts this system curve off to the left to intersect the pump at six gallons per minute. So you can look at balancing valves as a form of fine tuning, if you will. Okay. Now, you can do that manually with a single uh, circuit, and you can also do it with any circuits. Now, common practice is you're often with uh, several parallel circuits in a, in, a, in a system. Here we have a um, uh, design software to basically facilitate that task and, and save a lot of the math. If you've got two weeks of time in your hands, you can do it manually or use a high-quality program such as this from Hydronic Pros, whereby designer, you can take a look at this. This is actually a circuit right here. We have a circulator here. Flow is coming through the circulator, went into, in this case, three individual circuits. All right? And we took a snapshot of this uh, showing kind of what's happening. These are balancing valves, by the way. This is the fine-tuning mechanism that you adjust after everything else is done. All right? So prior to this part, the, the designer has defined his piping and his heat emitter. Okay? So if you click on here, you can define, I got a fan coil. It needs, um, uh, it's got this attribute to it. It needs a Y strainer, so he puts the Y strainer. And that basically all equates to a, basically a, a hydraulic resistance in that circuit. And then he adds to it a balancing valve to do the fine tuning. Now we have three circuits here. And let's say that this represents what the designer wants. For whatever reason, he wants to have 0.6 gallons per minute on his first leg, 0.5 on the second leg, and 8 on his last leg. Perhaps this is some kind of a bypass loop of some sort. Okay? Um, and uh, so the balance valve then uh, gets specified. And it's important to note here the C of E value. Okay? Because he adjusted this to equal the design flow rate. And where he stopped and got his design flow rate equated to a CV of 0.258. The project goes out the bid. The job is being constructed. The contractor has that balancing valve. And to make his task easier to balance, manufacturers will have a knob where the knob position will equate to the CV value across that valve, which is what the CV value represents. What does that do for the contractor if it goes along with the plan? Well, it makes his task of balancing a lot easier because theoretically uh, the valve could be installed as is and be perfect, right? Well, this is all theory and typically it's going to be off a little bit but it leaves the contractor just a little bit of fine-tuning to do, all right? Okay, now the issue of balancing manual balancing valves, which this is an example of, and we'll get into many different types of balancing valves, but if, um, if he weren't given uh, presetting uh, values, then if he changes one valve, the other valve, they're hydraulically coupled because in this case we have a fixed speed pump here, all right? So that it's an iterative approach in balancing manual balancing valves. Look at our design journal. It goes into details on that. Suffice to say, presetting is a very handy feature for contractors. Manufacturers like us publish flow coefficients as a function of the valve setting. We'll come back to these valves here. This is a shot of our fixed orifice type balancing valve and variable orifice. Okay, so let's go into a. Okay, the designer has designed a multi circuit system. He has his pump, uh, and we're going to talk basically constant flow. We'll get into variable flow, but let's assume that all of our crossovers here, when the zone calls for heating or cooling, it opens and we want a fixed flow rate. And so as long as the differential pressure across these supply headers, supply and return header leading to the circuits, is kept relatively constant, all right, the zones open and close, the flow rate in the remaining open zones will be fairly consistent. Okay? That's what we want to do 
is maintain that pressure differential across the supply uh, in return headers, okay? And there's different ways of doing that, and we'll get into what those common approaches are. So let's get into an example. Let's start off with our circuit being a fixed speed circulator, meaning it's a permanent split capacitor, standard pump, not variable speed. It could even be three speeds, one, two, and three, but it's fixed speed. Once it's uh, set, it's a fixed speed, okay? Very common. And let's assume that we have three circuits. We'll call it three zones. We have a balance, we have a zone valve, a load, and a balancing valve. In this case, we'll get back to these are manual balancing valves. All right. If there are only two or three zones, kind of rule of thumb, all right, or if the circulator here has a very call it flat curve like we showed in the other graph, there will be very little differential pressure control required. It basically can be emitted, such as a differential pressure bypass valve or, or some other means. Because especially with the flat curve, the pump itself is acting as the controller of differential pressure across our supply and return headers. So for example, under design conditions, let's assume that each of these loads has one gallon per minute going through them. All right? With a flat curve, the first zone closes off. And now the other ones go to 1.2 gallons per minute each, OK? And then the second one closes off, leaving only one zone open. It might go to perhaps 1.5 gallons per minute. Typically pretty acceptable. If the design flow rate at one gallon per minute is 2 feet per second average pipe velocity, then going to 1.5 gallons per minute, it's up to 3. So within the proper uh, guidelines of uh, hydronic design, no problem. But what happens when there are several zones, uh, four, five, six, ten? Or our circulator, for whatever reason, has a steep curve. We'll get into why we want to have steep curves uh, next month. All right. In this case, we have a situation where we have differential pressure control creep as zones close off, causing problems. So for example, going back to our example, let's say we have a, a pump delivering six feet ahead over here. And under design conditions, all of these deliver one gallon per minute. Okay. First zone closes off, maybe this goes, all of these go to 1.2 gallons per minute. The second one closes off, everyone goes to 1.5. Follow me? Fourth one closes off, maybe everything's two. And the last one closes off, it might be five gall gallons per minute. We want one, we just shut up to five. Now, if that's on a, a typical coil, copper coil, it's not going to want five gallons per minute, perhaps and 15 feet per second type pipe velocity, because you know that creates corro uh, erosion. All right. Not to mention this creep in differential pressure could cause any of these other zone valves that want to be closed to sneak open and cause ghost flows. Not a good condition. So what's a common technique to fix this issue? And leaving this schematic exactly as you see here, a simple little device called a pressure differential bypass valve or differential pressure bypass valve. Either way, it's the same thing. By putting this spring activated valve in place, it's set to be closed when all zones are calling. But as soon as the first zone closes, it starts to open up. So this zone closed, the one gallon per minute going through here might end up in 0.9 gallon per minute going through here. Not fully one, but the vast majority of what we're going through here, leaving pretty close to one gallon per minute our design flow here. All right? Next one closes, each goes up a little bit, goes up a little bit. When all of them are closed except for one, you might get one and a half gallon per minute. Acceptable. Good form of, of differential pressure control using this device. Now, before I leave this, you may ask, well, can I put that here? Can I put that here? How about if I put it over here at the end of the headers? No problem. For the most part, it's going to act equally as good either way. You won't be able to measure the difference, typically, in most applications. So put it where it's most convenient. So how do these work real quickly? This differential pressure bypass valve, here's a cutaway. Here is a little disc activated by a spring with a knob that can adjust the tension here, or the crack pressure at which the valve starts to open up. Sometimes these are called pressure-activated valves, pressure-activated uh, bypasses. They really are a balancing valve, as I indicated there. And they do flatten that pump curve, which is what we're really trying to do to maintain differential pressure control across our headers. So a, differ a differential pressure bypass valve causes the curve, the pump curve, to kind of flatten out here. Not perfectly flat, but instead of wrapping up like this and causing high flow rates when we only have one zone open, to have low flow rates closer to design. Okay? Let's continue on. 
I'm going quickly. There's going to be a lot of questions, I'm sure. By the way, we're recording this webinar. It will be posted on our website. And those that have an interest in uh, PDF as well, holler and we'll get that to you, including a certificate of completion. I forget, failed to mention that. So we're moving on. No one has bugged me, so I'm assuming I can be heard by everybody. So let's continue on with our fixed speed circulator. Another method is to use pressure independent balancing valves, PIBV. See? These are compact ones. We'll get into that in a second. Pressure, pressure independent. It should be called differential pressure independent because regardless of the differential pressure across this valve caused by whatever means, the valve will maintain the same flow rate in that circuit. So if they're set for one gallon per minute, these will all close. And this one remaining one open will continue delivering one gallon per minute. Fixed speed circulators, pressure independent balancing valves, good solution. Let's jump over to variable. Variable speed circulators, more and more common. Just about all circulators in Europe are this way, but in the United States, still a lot of fixed speed, but growing variable speed. A lot of design, a lot of benefits to variable speed, namely um, electrical consumption is minimized. Okay, so we have six zones here, manual balancing valves, variable speed circulator, a perfect marriage. This is a really good and very common approach to differential pressure control in systems. Okay, so if all of these are calling for one gallon per minute at design conditions, and if all but one are closed off, we might end up with 1.1 here or something like that. Okay? But it depends on what mode that we have the variable speed circulator operating at. There's something called constant pressure mode, meaning the pump is going to always try to maintain a constant differential pressure between its discharge and its suction side. All right? So if this were to be six, if six psi differential equates to one gallon per minute and usually six loops. You start closing off, you get to the last one, and it is it's still seeing six uh, PSI differential across this loop, so one gallon. There is a caveat though to variable speed. Constant pressure does not work real well if your distribution piping has high resistance, meaning perhaps between the six air handlers you have in the top of the gymnasium that you're controlling flow and the circulator down in the mechanical room on another, you might have two or three hundred feet between your pump and your loads. Or in a retrofit, you might have really small secondary supply return headers with small means what? High pressure job. So if you have constant pressure mode in that condition, by the time you close all of these off, you might be back up to mm, you know too high a flow rate in the remaining open one here. Okay? So a way to counter that is, number one, get rid of the manual balancing valves and put pressure independent balancing valves. Pressure independent balancing valves coupled with a variable speed circulator is a great match. These maintain exact flow rate, design flow rate, the variable speed minimizes the electrical consumption and thereby um, lifetime costs. Another approach you could use, keep your manual balancing valves in place and different manufacturers of variable speed pumps will say operate the pump in proportional pressure mode. So instead of having um, a constant 6 PSI differential across this pump you know, in proportional diff pressure mode, as zones close off, the pressure differential will back off. So with all six zones calling, for instance, you may have 6 PSI. As soon as one closes off, the pump senses it and backs it down to 5 PSI differential. 4, 3, 2, and perhaps down at the, with one zone open, 1 PSI. So it still varies the speed. It still monitors pressure, but it does it proportional to the number of zones still calling. Lastly, let's jump over to variable speed circuits. Common in commercial applications especially, common type of control device is a pressure independent control valve. And here we see those type of balancing valves or control valves, oftentimes used with some type of VFD or variable speed circulator. In tandem, they're a great uh, choice. They are electrically actuated versus self-actuated, like the other balancing valves we went through. And they replace what otherwise is a balancing valve and a zone valve combined into one. And you can configure them so that they're either on-off, meaning fixed speed, or fixed 
flow in each of your circuits or modulating. Modulating has the benefit of allowing a circuit to be controlled at different flow rates depending on different operating conditions. And while at a certain flow rate, if the pressure differential across that fluctuates, it nails it. It keeps it constant. So as an example, let's say um, we have one gallon per minute going through this at a certain state. And then our building automation system does through a DC or uh, a 2 to 10 type of uh, voltage uh, input. These accommodate all types of inputs. I want three gallons per minute. It will adjust to three gallons per minute. And regardless of what's happening elsewhere on, this, on the header, it's going to keep it at three gallons per minute. So they're pressure independent and modulating. So a good marriage for the especially commercial systems, uh, combined heating and cooling and things of that nature. This topic is all by itself worth an hour. Um, we do have, as Kalefi, have pressure independent control valves. You guys on the phone haven't seen them yet. We're still analyzing the North American market. And I think before we get done here, Kevin Freed, our application manager, will probably walk you through a little bit of that if we have time. Okay? So we're setting up, going over to the lab here. Before I send you over, let's take a look at the different balancing valves that Bob and Kevin will show you how to use and, and how they work. This is um, five balancing valves all on uh, uh, are coming off our supply header and a return header. At the bottom we have three, call it manual balancing valves, I'll define manual in a second, and automatic balancing valves. Let's get to our three manual balancing valves. Kind of a good, better, best. Good, better, best. I'm using that term, but it seems to apply here in this case. I'm going to start off with this guy, the best. This is called a manual type balancing valve, but quick setting. It's our best valve. Why? Well, unlike the other manual balancing valves, there's no pressure gauges to uh, slap up to it, take a reading to figure out the flow rate and make adjustments. Instead, the contractor, when it comes time to balance this circuit, pulls this pin, causes flow through a bypass circuit, and that little bead will ride up indicating the flow rate going through the valve. And then by taking a little crescent wrench, can adjust the adjust mechanism here Say it go, flows up to six, he wants four, he dials it down to four, let's go to the pin, and within seconds has set the flow. Quick setting, manual balancing valve. Bob will talk about this in a second. Here's a cross section. So for the engineers on board, how, how does this guy work? Here's the valve. We've got flow going this way. It's a Venturi type of valve. We neck down the flow, a smaller diameter right here. As a result, the velocity is a little higher here, creating a low pressure center. On this part of bypass, higher pressure here, and when the contractor pulls that pin, it induces flow through this circuit. We have a spring disc mechanism. The spring rises up in proportion to the flow, and the magnetic disc is attracted to a iron, a steel bead, and indicates the flow rate. Steel, yes, steel. Don't worry about it corroding because it's hermetically sealed away from the uh, system. That's the magnet. So there's no sight gauges, no clouding of the sight gauges as other sight gauges do in the, in the in hydronic systems elsewhere. Jumping down to our sight, I call it a good, better, uh, better. This is um, a valve many of you will recognize. A design it's called a Venturi valve. Some engineers will call it Venturi. Some will call it fixed orifice. Now, when we say fixed orifice, we're talking about the section of the valve in between the pressure ports used for setting the flow rate. It's fixed meaning we know in advance what the CV value of that is. As long as we know the CV value of any device, if we can measure the pressure differential across that by simple formula, we know the flow rate. So these type of valves have a direct correlation between pressure differential measured across here and the flow rate going through the valve. Okay, So uh, here you can see the Venturi effect. We have flow going left to right, large diameter here, and next down. The velocity of the fluid increases past this port, creating the Venturi effect. So this pressure here is always less than the pressure here, okay? Green, red. So the contractor will hook up a gauge, the red side here, the green side here, measure the pressure differential, and by doing that, knows exactly what the flow rate is. It's a direct relationship. Before I leave this slide, stainless steel globe, very nice to withstand any type of um, erosion issues if you have particles in your system, which many hydraulic systems do, or most do, in fact. 
Uh, I'm going to speed it up here and send over to John, uh, Bob in five minutes going down here as to the good. I hate to call it good because these are all fantastic valves. This type of valve is the workhorse in the industry, uh, if I had to guess. It's called a variable orifice, okay? Variable meaning between the pressure ports where you hook your gauges, as we adjust the valve to change the flow rate going through it, the, C, the, the CV value changes, okay? So, resultingly, there are two variables for the balancing contractor to take in consideration when he sets the flow rate using this type of balancing valve. Differential pressure, yes, and also the CV value dependent on where the knob location is set. All right, And then you can see the cross section here. We have a nice characterized plug design given us kind of a slow opening type of uh, function, which is nice for, for making it easier for, for balancing. OK, two more. Going to the top, pressure independent balancing valves. That first one looks common probably to a lot of guys. Um, here's a close up. These will maintain flow through them regardless of differential pressure changes across it. As long as those differential pressure changes are within an operating range, in this case, 2 to 32 PSI differential. Okay? So between 2 and 32, that's our pressure drop. So in that range, this valve will hold steady the flow rate. Okay? And in this case, the cartridge is going to always give you three gallons per minute. So they're build to order. A cartridge can go a half gallon per minute up to 20 gallons per minute, I think, is our selection. All right? What are these PT ports over here? Unlike those manual balancing valves, these do not, these do not, these are not used for flow. Flow is fixed. All right? It's meant to confirm that your differential pressure is within the operating range. Sometimes, Maintenance guys will like this to come by and check if they don't have some other means of flow measurement on their system. And also an integral ball valve. Okay? Here's the inside of them. Here's a flow cartridge. As, uh, here's the flow going through the cartridge. It's a spring. It's a piston spring mechanism. This is in the relaxed state. As pressure builds up, the uh, piston pushes in, closing off the amount of area flow can travel. Higher pressure, less area to travel. That characteristic with this type of shape gives you a constant flow over that range of differential pressure. Before I leave this, this is a polymer design. Engineers will know that springs have resonant frequencies. Uh, if attached to a metallic type cartridge, you can get a, what, a harmonic at a certain flow rate. And we've all heard those buzz before. So the Kalefi design has a very, basically changes that harmonic out of a typical flow uh, range setting in an application. So they're nice and quiet. And then our balancing valve. Also pressure independent. These two valves you'll find from Kevin and Bob here in a second operate equally three gallons. Uh, uh, they both, in this case, give three gallons per minute as we set it up in the lab. But it's small, right? We've eliminated some things. Got rid of the pressure ports. Some guys just don't need them. And we made it a union connection, but it's the same exact cartridge on the inside. 2 to 32 PSI. Uh, we don't know it. On the back side, it says three gallons per minute, but we know from the model number, 3GO means three gallons per minute. And before I leave this, IAPMO R&T. The bottom four balancing valves that you just saw are third-party certified lead-free. The plumbing engineer is going to like that because in hot water research and other type applications where you want to dial in recirculation flow, you have now four selections from Kalefi to do that, automatic or pressure dependent. So I'm going to go over to the lab, hopefully, if I do this right. Uh, so what you're going to see, when I flip over, you're going to see a lot of pipes and instrumentation in the lab. But what Bob and Kevin are going to do, here's those five balancing valves that we're going to demonstrate. We've got pressure gauges on the supply and return headers we can take a look at. We have isolation valves that simulate a zone turning on and off. We have a differential pressure bypass valve Bob will demonstrate. We have a pump where Kevin is it's going to be operating in fixed speed mode, but we're going to make it into a big pump, small pump, show what the effect is over here. And then lastly, we have a couple of highly accurate flow meters so we can see what's going on for your own very eyes. All right. I'm going to switch over. Bob, can you still hear me? I can. Thanks for doing that. That was a good job. I'm going to see if you can get a little bit more on your paycheck next week. Yeah, I'll uh, talk to the guy see if he can't do that. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we're on. All right, thanks, everybody. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending today. We've got a great crowd, good numbers today. I want to first, uh, first I'm going to start by showing off our lab. This has been a project been going on for 
oh gosh, at least a year now. It's been a joint product. Mike Trainer did the original design work. Kevin got involved. He did all the, uh, Kevin was like the general contractor, the GC. He got all this stuff built, the, the cabinets and the Unistrut that we've got on here, stainless steel Unistrut and stuff. And then I came in and scribbled on it with this copper pipe. So we worked together on this. But uh, if uh, Nick can follow me, Nick's uh, running the camera today with a uh, Neanderthal video company here. So we'll see how this goes. Thanks, Nick. I want to just quickly explain uh, how this works and what we can do here in the lab. So we've got city water pressure coming in here, which varies from the city. Right now we've got about 130 PSI coming in here. And we've put a couple different regulators here so we can regulate if we want high flow to do like a dump uh, through a mixing valve or something like that. We can run through a uh, inch and a quarter line here with the pressure reducing valve. We've got a smaller reducing valve. If we want to have real accurate uh, low flow control, we've got that. Or we can bypass those and have real high pressure on systems. Moving to this next cell, this is where we could do most of our test work. Today we're going to show you all these different uh, balancing valves that we've got set up here and how they operate. Uh, we've got nice gauges on here. We've got the uh, differential bypass valve at the top here. This is the black box that you're going to see here. This is the pressure uh, transducer. We've got the ultrasonic uh, flow meters on this, and this is going to read the flow rate. So when we have this in bypass, uh, when we get down to where Kevin is here in a minute, you'll see where all the digital displays that will show as we make uh, adjustments or changes in these. It's going to show you the flow rate change. And moving down here a little bit further, we've got um, sensors all over this so we can do different temperatures as well as pressure. So these different sensors will measure two different things, both pressure and uh, temperature in different parts of it. We've got it warmed up today so we can show you how to uh, set a uh, pressure differential bypass with temperature by just using your hands on the two pipes and seeing when you got a temperature going across it. A little bit further down, this is a uh, motorized mixing valve. So if we want to do, for example, uh, thermostat mixing valve testing and we want to uh, change the temperature going into the hot port of it, we can modulate this valve. This, in fact, I think Woody that worked with us, this is one of his projects when he was with another company years ago. He was kind of happy to see that show up here. That was some hard work when he was with uh, Johnson Controls many years ago. So down one more step. This is where most of the work's going to be done. Um, I'm going to introduce Kevin in a second. He's going to be driving our circulator here. We can, we've got a choice of different circulators that we can operate depending on what kind of flow rates we want to run. We're going to use this big baby today. This is all a magic pump, the things this can do. So Kevin's going to be operating this as I'm doing the work down there. So uh, we will flash back to Kevin occasionally, but we don't want to keep moving the camera a lot. So I'll be talking back and forth with Kevin. He's going to ramp pump speed up and down to give us different flow rates. And we're going to show how that affects the balancing valves and how those can compensate for that. So we've got the pump here to do that. These are our two different flow meters right here. So right now the pump's running through. All of our valves are open, wide open now on the balancing valve. So we're flowing about 13, what, 13 and a half gallons per minute through all of our system right now. This one you see is reading zero. This has got a transducer on our bypass line. So as I start showing you how to adjust that, this is one means that you can see what's going through your bypass valve through this flow meter here. Down a little bit further behind the wall here is where we have our water heater that's heating it up. Got another cell here that we can do additional testing. So Kevin, come on in. Let me introduce Kevin. I think you might remember Kevin from a webinar two ago. He did the one on listings and stuff like that. And thanks for uh, partnering with me today to do all the um, the heavy lifting with the uh, operation down here. He's got the operating license, so he can do all that. So. All right. I want to take it back now. We'll go through the valves. Mark's kind of laid the groundwork on how these valves operate. We'll show you uh, real life uh, conditions on this. Um, <clears throat> get the camera over here. Let me take my little pointer out. This might help. So here I've got one of our pressure activated bypass valves piped in. We do offer this in three different sizes from Calefi. We've got a three quarter, a one inch, and one quarter. So depending on the flow rate that you need to bypass, you can select the right size. Nice quality valve. A couple things I want to tell you about this valve before we get into the adjusting. I like to put it in with a shutoff valve like this because what can happen if you're going to try and pressure purge a system with a high pressure pump, like uh, some guys use swimming pool pumps or a high head pump to purge out loops if they've got long maybe snow melt loops or something like that, if you've got a pump that develops a lot of pressure, you can actually blow this valve open and you're trying to purge your loop and you're saying, gosh, I'm not getting much flow out of my loops. What's going on? Well, the bypass is probably doing its job by bypassing that flow. So if you install them and put an isolation valve either side, really, you can shut that off, do all your purge, and then go back and open it up. So we're going to show you that. We're going to start with the, um, the quick set of Mark talked about. I want to tell you a couple other things about this valve right here. We also offer that as what we call the uh, quick setter plus valve. And this was a uh, response from the field. They said, gosh, we love that quick setter valve. It's really user friendly. It's installer friendly. Why don't you make one that we could use for domestic water research calibration? And so what we did, we added some really nice features. We've got a check valve on the bottom. 
but we don't have reverse flow going through that. We put a temperature gauge. So if you want to balance your different research loops with temperature, if you don't know exactly what flow rates are required, you can just watch the temperature gauge, see when you got your thing. And the big thing that we did is we put a much lower scale on this, because sometimes you've got a research loop that only needs about half gallon a minute. So if I don't know, Nick's zooming in on that, you can see this one goes down to a 0 0.5 uh, gallon per minute flow rate. We've got two different versions. I think the other one goes from one to uh, uh, it goes a little bit higher. That's not the right gauge I'm showing you, by the way. But <laughs> the Quick Setter Plus does, in fact, go down to a 0.5. So you can real dial in a real low flow rate. It is, of course, uh, low lead, so it can be used on domestic water applications. This is available in a half, three quarter, and one inch, fairly common sizes for uh, research groups, even for a little residential or bigger commercial building. That would cover a wide range. So. Now we talked about uh, balancing the quick setter valve. What I like to use is just a little open end wrench you can put on here and you can make your fine tuning adjustments. Some guys, if you don't have a, uh, what is that, a 3 8 open end, certainly a crescent wrench, something like that. It doesn't take much to turn that. It's a real smooth acting valve, easy to adjust and change. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you what's going through this system right now. So I'm showing exactly, oh, just under five gallons a minute flowing through there with all these different circuits open. Now Kevin's going to, um, I'm going to turn off some of these valves, and we're going to start with this one here, and we'll show you how to set up the, um, the bypass valve first, the pressure-activated bypass valve. So we've got this piped right in now, and we've got the valves open. But we've got some of our flow going through three valves right here. These we'll get to a little bit later. We've got a 3 GPM flow rate through this one. We've got a 3 GPM flow rate through that one. And right now we're reading about... Oh, we're up a little over 7 GPM now. I opened that up a little bit with the wrench. I want to get that down to 5 just to show you the adjustability of that, and that's the number that we've been practicing with, so I'll stick with that. Now, Kevin, you should be able to tell me on the ultrasonic flow meter what kind of flow rate I have, so he can look down there and see if we added all those up, we would come up with. Right, right now we have about 12.3 GPM in the whole circuit, and right now the way the bypass valve is set, we do have some bypass going through there. Yeah. So we're going to turn this down first so this valve is off. Kevin can tell me that. He'll watch on that lower. If you're still down on that screen there, you can watch on that lower one. We get down to zero on our bypass, right? About there, I think, when that screw's right facing me, we're down yeah. to zero. Okay. Right. No bypass valve now. And this is good because all of our zones that we want running right now are running. Nothing's slipping through there. Now I can see that at the meter there that Kevin's got in front of him. And I can also feel that because I've got hot water. I think we're running this, what, about 105 degrees right now. I can feel temperature up here. This pipe is relatively cool here. So I know that I'm not getting any bypass by just feeling it. The installer can do that on the job. He's got his boiler up the temperature. Or maybe he's using chilled water. So it could be you could feel cold water up here and nothing here. So now we want to adjust that threshold point that Mark was talking about, the point where this valve is going to start to lift off of the seat. So I'm going to take this valve now, and I'm just going to open it up. And basically, I'm lessening the spring tension on that little uh, flapper in there. So this is just a balancing valve is what I'm doing. So I'm going to slowly open it up, and Kevin's going to tell me when I get some flow going through that. And I can also tell, I'll know the same thing because I can feel it here. Go down to Kevin there, if you will, for a second, Nick. Right. So now we have flow through the bypass that uh, transducer is picking up about 0.8 GPM and about 10.5 GPM in the main line. So we are bypassing some of that flow now. Exactly. So now we know that's the threshold point. Now what we'll do, and I think we tell you this installation, now we want to turn this valve back about one turn, somewhere between three-quarter one turn, about where it just started a second ago, and you'll see the meter will drop down to zero. So now we've got that valve set so that when all of our zones are calling for heat, we're not getting any slippage, we're not bypassing at all, but as I start shutting these valves off in a second, you'll see how the meter's going to start jumping up. And I can also watch this on this meter here, too, as I make changes. I'll pull this from time to time, and I'll show what happens as we turn off different valves here. So, Right. Now that's set about right, Bob, because you don't have any bypass right now, but okay. just with another half a turn or so, it would start to bypass. So. All right. So that's the idea. That's the threshold point. That's the perfect setting for that bypass valve. And again, if I could do that with my hand, I would just put my hand here and I'd wait for that temperature to be felt here, turn it down. Because not everybody's going to have a flow meter on the system that they're able to set it that way. So you've got both options to set it. All right, now let's jump in and start doing uh, some balancing here. And I think what we'll want to do is we're going to start with the uh, pressure, uh, the uh, pressure independent sorry, balancing valves, the PICV valves. So we've got two different ones here. These are both set at 3 GPM. Cartridges are built into these, as Mark explained. Inside these is a cartridge. 
that's a cylinder with a piston. The piston moves back and forth. Now the piston has to remain active in there. So for that piston to be active where it can regulate flow, it needs to be, and I'll say this right on the tag, and of course when you specify this valve, it'll tell you that pressure uh, differential that that valve has to operate between. Because if we were to fall below 2 PSI, what's going to happen is that cartridge is now all the way backed off and it doesn't have any adjustability. And if we were to exceed 32 PSI, we would go the opposite way. The piston would push all the way to the other end of the cylinder and we don't have any resolution or adjustability. So, And I'm going to be able to demonstrate that in these gauges here. We've got two pressure gauges that we put right here so you can see them in camera as I'm adjusting that. And you'll see as we change pump speeds, Kevin's going to ramp pump speeds up and down to show you what's going on. So right now, if I were to close this valve off, I've got three gallons a minute here, three gallons a minute here. Not very much delta T going across there. I've got maybe, what, 26 pounds there, about 24 there. So I'm right at my threshold point there, about three GPM. I want to turn off my bypass valve in this, because now I just want to concentrate on all of our flow coming down through the circuit here, by the way. This is going into all the valves from the circulator down there, through the valves, down this side, returning back through the piping that I showed you in the beginning. So now, if I'm not uh, mistaken, We've got three and three. We should have exactly six gallons a minute going through this. Even though our pump, remember, we've got our pump up around what we started at 12 and a half GPM is flowing through this circuit. But now it's just being regulated by these two pressure activated uh, valves here. And what do we have down there, Kevin? I'm predicting about uh, six gallon per minute flow. Yep, just under six. Yeah, so we're, we've got it dead nuts on there. Now, if I were to close off one of these, what would I have there? I've got three GPM on each one of these. I'm shutting one off. I should have right around three. It takes a second to stabilize the pressure here. Yes. There it is. I can see the meter from here, right? That's 2.9. 2.9. So right in the money there. Now, the other thing that we could do is I'm going to ask Kevin to change some pump speeds. He's going to say, well, what if that pump were to ramp up in the building, other zones, or something we're calling? Can this valve, in fact, if my delta P starts coming off, can it still nail that pressure right at 3 GPM? How accurate can these valves really work? So give me some more juice there, Kevin. Tell me what right. you're Okay, doing. we'll increase the pump speed by 50%. You tell what we do right here as it ramps up. Thanks, Kevin. So see what happened to our pressure here? We started down, what, we're at 24. Now we're up about 32 pounds pressure. You can see our delta P now is changing because, again, he's got that pump speed up where we're trying to uh, move a lot more flow through these, but this valve is really starting to do its work now. We're still well within the range here, so if you were to take the 32 minus the, uh, let's call it 24, there, do the math on that, we're still within that delta P range for this valve to operate. So this car now is seeking its spot in there that it has to bypass just enough so we're going to get a 3 GPM flow. 3 and 3 we should be right at 6. I'm seeing 6.1 down there, Kevin. Yeah, you're right at so you 6.1. Even with that pump starting at, uh, what are we, half again, the capacity coming out of the circulator there is going through these valves. You can probably hear in the background that pump starting to complain a little bit, trying to drive that much flow through two uh, small valves like that. Well, let's take it. Sky's the limit here. Take it up again. Let's see what we can do. And we'll notice when Kevin bumps the pump speed up, the output of that circulator on that magnet pump. Okay, now you'll hear that. It went up 20 more percent. Yeah, 20 more percent. I get the women and children outside now. So you can see we're up to 40 pounds there. Let's call it about 25 there if I'm looking straight on. So now we've got a 15-pound uh, pressure differential between those. Both valves are open. I'm predicting, again, we're going to be within 3 plus 3, yeah. 6 gallons a minute. We're still at 6. We? Yeah, a little bit higher there, 6.2. But we're really moving. I think we looked earlier with that pump on this speed, we're probably moving about 30 32 gallons per minute through the system. But these two valves, even with 32 gallons per minute, coming out of that circulator down there, these valves are making sure that we've got exactly what we designed for, exactly what we needed at the air handlers or whatever the heat emitter might be. So proves that that works out. Um, what else can I tell you about that? Now, every one of these valves that we built from Clippy is going to have something unique in it. We want to do something different than everybody out there. This, Mark told you earlier, we use a polymer cartridge so we don't get any noise created in there. We make it easy for the installer. If you had to change that cartridge on this one, thanks, Kevin. You bumped it down a little bit so I don't get wet here. If we had to change the cartridge, maybe the uh, engineer came and said, you know, I missed the design by a little bit, and you put a bigger cartridge in there. And this version here, we can, in fact, take it out. Some installers like to put a little valve in there that they could flush it out. If any dirt or debris ever would get caught in where the spool was hanging up or something, the port that we give you in here to flush it out. Isolation valve here so you can shut it off to do work on it. Then also, as Mark said, we've got a couple PT ports, pressure temperature ports, these are called up here. So you could put your pressure differential meter that I'm going to show you here in a second across that and confirm that this is, in fact, working to the spec that we build it to. If you knew the pressure drop across that, we would give the information to uh, determine what the flow rate is going through that. So 
Union connection on that. Uh, going down a step on this one, again, this is a low lead. This, some guys are using this on domestic water applications, and what they're doing with this is they're putting it on jobs where people put in a big body spray, and they don't want them to overdraw the water heater and bring the water heater out in the first couple minutes. They'll get maybe an 8 or 10 gallon a minute one of these and put it right on the outlet of the domestic water heater so they can't uh, bring the water heater instantly. So that's nice. Union connections, again, this one can be changed on the job. You're going to have to tell us what you need. We'll build it. We'll put a sticker on it. It's not something that you can uh, change or modify in the field. So um, those are the pressure uh, valves. We've got the bypass valve. We talked about the quick setter, the quick setter plus. I want to go down to our last two uh, manual valves right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to open those up. Let's turn off the pressure activated valves up there, and now we'll talk a little bit about this. Now, as Mark said, if you have the information and you've done the calculations, you could preset this valve and get it in the ballpark. But what you really want to do, since this valve is that accurate of an adjustability range, you want to really confirm what's going on here and know that you've got the flow rate that you designed for that you need in the system. So you're going to need a pressure differential meter to do that. And here's an example of one. So basically, this is a meter that's going to reg register uh, the pressure differential by measuring both ports on that thing. So the way this valve, uh, this meter would work is you're going to have these little uh, needles that almost look like a basketball inflation tool, and you'll take off these caps here, color-coded, and you can see the red and green or red and blue in this case here, and you would just push those in there, and I don't do that, I'm going to get wet right now, but if you push that in there, that meter is going to measure the pressure differential across that valve. By the way, these ports, we call them pressure temperature ports, I should be using my pointer here, uh, PT ports, pressure temperature, because you've probably all seen these pot thermometers, you could actually put that in one of those holes, and I can see my temperature, you can see them rising up, I'll probably get up to 105 degrees, so that could be used to measure temperature, if for some reason you wanted to know that, or let's say you don't have a differential pressure meter and you just want to see what your pressure is, you could do the same thing, you get one of those needles for a pressure gauge, you put that in there and you can see there's the pressure that we're uh, operating our system at right now, so that's why they're called PT ports, you can see the water sprays on them when you hook up to them. So that's what we're going to do on this one. We're going to put the pressure meter on there, and let's just say, and we know this because we tried it earlier, that we've got about a three-pound pressure differential between those two. So now what you want to do with this valve is you're going to go to the information that is supplied with it. This is a little graph, so we've highlighted. I don't know how well you can see that. You can find these online also if you want to get. Now, there you go. Thanks for zooming in. So what you're going to do now, like I said, we've got a three-pound pressure differential across that. We measured that with delta P meter. We're going to do that. And now we know what size valve this is. This is a three-quarter valve. So we'll go out to the three-quarter valve line right here, run that three-pound um, pressure differential out to that. And if we follow that straight down now, that's going to tell us our flow rate. So that's saying this valve, open by itself, should be giving me 11 gallons per minute flow rate right now. If I'm looking over there, I'm seeing right at that on the money there. So that is, in fact, how you would uh, set that valve up, how you would check that valve. And that's the chart that you have to use to do that. That's our 130 series. Now this, the 142, this is going to be a little bit more complicated because Mark said this is going to be doing two things. This has got the variable orifice in it, so we're going to be changing the CV of this valve as we make uh, adjustments and corrections on this. So on this one, you're going to have to read that number right there. If I set that at 2.5, let's go over to the other chart. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have to read that number that we've got that set at 2.5, and that's the line that we're going to have to use. We put our meter on this. We know that we've got that 3-pound delta P again. We use the same example for both of those. If we were to read at that 3 pounds on this axis over here, read that over to the 2.5 setting that we've got this on, and if we read that down, thanks, Kevin, for doing these so nicely. It makes it a lot easier to see exactly 3 gallons a minute. So both these valves are now adjusted to 3 gallons a minute, and that's going to be confirmed or checked or adjusted by using the delta P meter. You really need to have a meter. I don't know that everybody um, out there doing it has access to one of these meters. A lot of times you can get your rep to loan you a meter like this. Most of the people that uh, supply this type of equipment will have access to a fairly pricey meter, which brings me back to why this is all, everybody here at Cloppy, our favorite valve, because this one, here it is, right there. You can make a you know, you can check your flow rate, you can make your adjustments, and it just uh, it takes those steps out of it. But there's a place for every one of these valves. There isn't one that's better suited to every job than the other. You're going to have to define the job, define the application, and just select the valve that has 
the adjustability that has the features and the functions that you need for your job. They're all uh, intended. What I consider a balancing belt to be is if you pick up a pair of binoculars and you're looking for your deer out there during the hunting season and you take those little eye pieces and you start turning them to adjust them, that's what we're doing with this. Now we do have pumps with multiple speed. We've got variable speeds. But this, as Mark showed, even with the variable speed, we can really dial in and get that fine resolution with a balancing valve of some sort here, either the automatic ones or the manual valves there. So what else can I show you while I'm right here? I wanted to also, uh, Kevin's got some good background with these, uh, with the new pick valve that we're going to have out. We've got this valve out, Mark said, already globally, thinking about bringing this to the market. So I want to bring Kevin back into the screen here and talk a little bit more about this because he's got a really, uh, a really heavy background in the way this valve operates, and I don't. So yeah. Kevin, Thanks, what Bob. can you tell yeah. me? Uh, Mark mentioned the, the pick valve, that it can do modulation. And what that means is if you have an analog controller with a 4 to 20 milliamp output or a 0 to 10 volt output signal, you can control this valve, and it gives you better control than just an on-off valve. So another feature here is you, on this particular one, is you can set it for direct acting or reverse acting. And what that means is if you want it to open on a call for heat or open on a call for cool, you can set it so that it'll do either. And you can also split the signal. In other words, you can get two valves and control both of them with one analog output signal. By, uh, by splitting the, for example, 0 to 10 volt outputs, you can set your heating valve for 0 to 5 volts direct acting and have that open on a call for heat. And the cooling valve can be set for 5 to 10 volts DC and have that open on a call for cooling. So right in the middle, when you're at set point, both valves are closed. So it's a really advanced product, and uh, look for more on this in the coming year. And it's a beautiful valve. Look at the uh, machine quality in that. Compact, that's the key to this valve, because remember, this is going to replace two valves. We might have to get this in a, a cabinet on an air handler or a cassette heater or something like that, so we want small. And again, we've got the ability to put uh, PT ports in there, so if you want to confirm that with the uh, Delta P gauge that we just showed you, those plugs can come out. You can put the ports in there, and you can test that with the uh, with the flow meter. Of course, the top comes off and stuff. It looks like that even has some hem threads on it. Kevin, you can see those, but if yeah. Nick can get in that close. In uh, Europe, since that's a straight thread, we kind of knurl that, so when you wrap your hemp around there, it grabs it so it doesn't slide off. So yeah, that's a beautiful valve, not only in function, but uh, come by our booth at Ashray, and we'll show that off, too, in January. Yeah, it's a really advanced valve with uh, high-tech control. I think it's the future of the control valve industry. So what did we miss, Mark? Do you have any yeah, questions? Um, the attention meter really jumped when you, for the guys listening out in Colorado when you mentioned hemp. Uh, yeah, that's where it comes from now, I guess. <laughs> no, I think I think that might be it. Um, so here we are with our social media, our Facebook author to the left, uh, me doing some of the little um, uh, YouTube videos there, the little quickie three to eight minute ones, and then of course at the bottom there on our Twitter account. Any other questions that we can do quickly, Mark? I know we're just a few minutes over here, but uh, there we are. Oh, much younger me there. Where did that come from? <laughs> Kevin. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and uh, keep in touch, and let us know how we can help you. Bye-bye.